And that kind of leads into how do we help people help us? And how do like me as a professional um, and you pastor help the teens and the youth and the people struggling um, and really what, um, what do they need, right? I think that a lot of the times um, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, it'll be okay, it's fine, you're okay. Um, I think that's probably the number one thing that I hear people struggle with is just being invalidated, right? No, nothing that you feel or nothing that you think is either right or wrong, it just is. Um, and that's, I mean, honestly, <laughs> kind of half of my job. And, and I think a lot of the things that I encourage people to do is just validate your own and other people's emotions. Um, and that really can just, again, help people feel safe and say like, okay, it's okay to feel how I feel. And, and that's all there is to it. Right. And with us too, it's, it, as it turns out, your pastor is not the sin police. Uh, like, it's not his job to peer as deeply into your life to find things to kick you out of the church for. Your pastor is not the sin police. He, he will call it like he sees it. He will address your life in light of the Ten Commandments for what you bring him. But that's the whole point. Your pastor is given to you by God so that you would have a place to take those emotions. You would have a place to take those sins. You would have somebody to actually uh, speak to you, God's own word. He's not the sin police. He's, he's the mouth of God who speaks forgiveness. He's the mouth of, of God that speaks salvation. Your, your pastor is given to you so that there would actually be a place so you can take all of these things that you do have and find forgiveness for them. And that, if you understand it, not as a, a place to go and pay your penance or, or, or somebody who wants to dive into your life too deeply to find reasons to not love you, but as somebody who wants to tell you that Jesus already did love you, that changes how we can address sin and even just being exposed to sin. Sin is too scary to talk about if there's not a solution for it other than be better and don't be a sinner anymore. But if there is forgiveness of sin because Jesus already died and already rose from the dead, then you actually have somebody who has hope to preach to you. you, you your pastor exists to, to tell you over and over and over again that your sins are forgiven, that your identity is in holiness and righteousness, not burdened by what you have done, not burdened by what has been done to you, but restored by what has been done for you in Christ. If there is actual hope, then sin isn't too scary to talk about because there's an actual resurrection. There, there's a, an answer to all of the things that are wrong, rooted firmly in the fact that Christ is risen from the dead and as bad as things are and as awful as you feel, it hasn't managed to go back 2000 years and put Jesus back in the tomb. He is still risen. And we can confront those real feelings you have with a real resurrection and so find shelter under the cross. This is what, what clergy can do. But there are other vocations given by God to address mental health. Uh, and it's an important distinction because like you, I, I'm not trained to, to be a counselor. And honestly, if, if I go tinkering in that, well, it's sort of like, I love my parishioners, but if they need brain surgery, I shouldn't be the guy. And in the same way, I love my parishioners. I love my sheep, but it, it, I should actually have somebody to work hand in hand with. Um, and in the same way, I, I've been given, I've been sent by God to, to wear this shirt, not because I'm earned it, not because I'm holier than anyone else, but because he's established a place where you can be sure that mouth is speaking God's words. Uh, counselors aren't supposed to be your pastor either. And neither are, for example, parents and friends. Uh, this is one of those things that we especially have, uh, well, at least I have, I have issue with with teenagers is it's so much easier to go to your friends and your folks than your pastor than your counselor because, well, they're, they're alongside you in it, but they're not always necessarily the best equipped to deal with it. Uh, God gives us other vocations to address mental health and we need to, to be able to, to, to speak to what it's like to have friends who are struggling with these things. I, I think first and foremost, uh, if you have friends, maybe just don't ignore the warning signs. I, I think it's not your job to fix everything. And knowing that it's not your job to fix everything is a freeing gift. If you want to make it your burden to fix everything, but you don't know how to fix it, what a what an awful thing to live under. I, I, I know that, that some of my, my sheep have cancer. That's not mine to fix. And it's a joy to say that's somebody else's problem and God will give them doctors for that, but I can pray with them. And in the same way, it, knowing that God has given your friends pastors, given your friends doctors, given your friends parents, it frees you from having to try and be all of those things for people when you haven't been given to be. But it, it also frees you to love them in the ways that you have, have been given to love. 
I think you make a great point, Pastor, about how not everybody is meant to do everything for everybody, right? I think that, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I stress to my clients um, is really that it's okay to have levels of support, right? Not every friend, not every single person in your life has to be a person that knows your deepest, darkest secrets and everything you're struggling with. Um, and again, on the other end of that spectrum, um, not everybody is an unsafe person, right? Not everybody that you have to meet only has to know your first and last name, and that's not all they know about you. Um, I think that there can be levels of, hey, these are things that, things that I talk to my family about. These are things that I am comfortable talking to them about. These are the things that I talk with my friends about. Um, and this is what I talk to my pastor about. This is what I talk to my doctor about, right? There are different people that we have in our lives. Um, and, and that's kind of what we aim to do is have like a full and um, varied support system um, because people have different strengths, right? Um, e even counselors have different, um, you know, things that they, sp that they specialize in. Um, there's different kinds of mental health professionals. There's different kinds of doctors. There's, um, you know, some states where counselors can prescribe medications, some states where they can't. There's different vocations. There's different levels of what people can help you with. Um, and I think the more, again, that that's normalized and recognized and talked about and, you know, somebody says, Hey, I'm struggling with this. And somebody else says, Hey, you know, I've had an experience with a counselor. I've seen a therapist. It really helped me. You should try it out. Um, I think the more normal that is, the more that that is just equated again to like, Hey, I'm not feeling good. I'm going to go to the doctor. Um, the easier that's going to be for people to seek out help and recognize like, that's just what you do. That's how it works. That's what those things are there for. I think it, it's maybe, um, a good time to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a parent with somebody, uh, a child who's struggling with mental health, because talking about sort of where your lane is, uh, it's harder when you're a parent and your lane sort of touches on all of these things, but also doesn't completely fill all of these things. It, it's it's um, also really important because as a parent, you probably care more than anybody else. I, I mean, if, if your kid's struggling, I, I know how much sleep you've lost. The problem is though, uh, when our kids are, are hurting, the only thing in the world we want to do is keep them safe. The only thing we want to do is, is try and control that situation. And so that's not the gospel. That is only the law. The law is what we use to try and control things, right? Uh, on your father and mother, that it would be well with you and you would live long upon the earth is what our Lord would say. And that, that's just sort of simple recognition that sin breaks stuff. And so trying to control the situation by minimizing the sin always sounds great on paper. It's, it's true that if you sinned less, there'd be less broken stuff. But that's not also necessarily all that helpful um, in, in the same way that if I wasn't uh, short and awkward, I guess I could play in the NBA, but since I am <laughs> short and awkward, that's not going to happen. Uh, as a parent who wants desperately to control the situation, understand that Jesus died for your kids and you need to deal with them in light of the gospel too. You can't just deal with them by controlling the situation. It, it's, it would be great. But because there is more going on than we can control by our works of the law, our Lord has given us the gospel. You get to be something utterly unique to your child. You get to be somebody who, who not only can, can point out that which is good and virtuous and beautiful in the law, but as somebody who can point out that which is merciful and, and full of hope in the gospel. You can point them to the fact that their identity is in more than what's going on in their lives. You can point them to the people who have been given to address this. You don't need to be the absolute doctor. You can point them to the doctor. You don't need to be the counselor. You can trust that God has also given them. You don't need to be their pastor. You can find God working in all of these things. And so deal with your children the same way that you would deal with any other sin. You can't discipline your mind any more than you can perfectly stop sinning. So don't cut your kids off from the gospel. This is actually probably a place where they need it even more. I, I know it's tempting to try and control the situation, but recognize that, that Christ who has risen from the dead actually has something to say about it too. Focus on the gospel. I think the hardest thing when it comes to parents is them thinking that taking their kid to therapy, having them get help, having them seek services means that they failed in some way, it means that they did something wrong, that sometimes their ego is bruised um, and that they, did, they didn't do enough. Again, it's, it's back to that not doing enough. 
um, and that because my kid is struggling with this, um, I didn't do something or I did something. Um, obviously, when it comes to trauma and we talk about all that, that's a different situation. Um, but I mean, there are all kinds of scenarios where, you know, parents have done everything that they could have done. They supported their kid and that's how they're, how they developed, right? That's what happened in their brain. And they're struggling with anxiety or depression or self-harm or having suicidal thoughts. Um, and, and it, it's not helpful to play the blame game or to, um, you know, say, okay, what did I do wrong? I think that's something that I've seen a lot where parents are like, well, what did I do? What could I, you know, have changed? And, and at this point, you know, unless it's causing trauma, it's not really about that. It's dealing with the issue, right? It's dealing with what your kid is struggling with. Um, and that's, that's the point. And I think that, you know, what I've seen is that parents that are supportive of kids going to therapy, seeking services, getting help and, and, from people, from professionals that are, that's their job to do that. Um, the more encouraging that is to the kid, because it's like, okay, my, my parental figure, my guardian is saying, Hey, this is what we should do. This is what this is for. Um, and, and that makes them more likely to, to go right. And to be open to it. Um, and also I think the biggest thing too, is providing that space for your kid. I know that again, like you said, pastor, the parents want to help, right? They want your kid to be, they want their kid to be safe. They want them to get better and feel better and be okay. Um, and therapy is a place where, you know, obviously depending on the age, parents are involved, kids are involved. Everybody's kind of a team. Um, but also just like letting the teen or the kid or the youth have that space to share whatever they need to share, and, and let that be right. And, and I, and if there's something that needs to be addressed or discussed, the therapist will and should bring that up and talk about it. Um, but also just letting, letting them figure it out and letting them address it and kind of empowering them to deal with it. And, and again, empowering them to, um, really address their own mental health needs. And that's helping them develop as an adult, right? Develop and kind of change those generational um, issues and the generational trauma of saying like, no, this is not okay. Um, and so again, I think the more that parents can kind of, again, like you said, take the burden off of themselves and say, these people are here for a reason. They're here to help my kid. Um, and let that be what it is and step in as needed or as requested or whatever that looks like. Um, but really saying this is the purpose, this is what's going on. Um, and these are the people that are here to help. And so I'm doing that. And again, I'm taking the burden off of myself and that's what these people are here for. Yeah. And let go of that word enough. Um, enough is a word that measures, uh, enough is a word that, that comes from the law, do this and you shall live do enough of this and you shall live. The problem with the word enough is that, well, look at the 10 commandments. You have not done enough. You're a sinner. Uh, when it comes to actually caring for people, you are so free in the gospel that you can stop measuring by the law. You are free to do away with the word enough because, well, the law will make sinners of us all, but you don't have to try and measure enough in yourself so you can feel better about the situation. Instead, you can find your enough in Christ who says it is enough. It is finished. It is forgiven. It is alive. Christ has given you your enough. It's, and, and he has established this to, to be the way that we deal with each other so that the Christ who literally died and rose to address that which you're going through, well, he, he also wants to, to help carry you along. You are so free from the word enough that just worrying about what's in front of you can still be shaped by the law, by that which is good in light of the Ten Commandments. But you don't have to try and measure up to them. You just get to, to find them, to, to be a, a thing that would give you light as you, you go forward. Let go of the word enough and, and recognize that as much as you want to, to be better, Christ wants to address this too. And he addresses it in his own way by being your enough upon the cross so that you don't have to be enough by your working of the law. If, if we want to deal with mental health and the word enough, mental health exists because, well, me bad mental health exists because deep down somewhere something wasn't. So if we're going to address it, let's over and over again find shelter under the cross where he is, is our enough.